Glia used to be thought of as the, uh, I don't know, the pro proletariat, the extremely numerous uh, cells that were there to serve the neurons. And to a certain extent, that's, that's true. There are a couple dents in that story, though. First of all, uh, at one time, it was thought that glia outnumbered neurons 10 to 1. That appears not to be the case. In, in fact, there appear to be about equal numbers, about 85 billion neurons in a human brain, 85 billion uh, glial cells in a human brain. The other thing that is, is emerging is that glia are very important in the normal function, the development and the function of the nervous system. N the, the ways in which glial cells are important are not fully appreciated yet, but this is certainly an emerging uh, area of, of, of great excitement. So let's, let's meet the characters here. I told you before that there was an exception to the idea that all the cellular components of the nervous system are derived from neuroectoderm, and that exception is the microglia. There are two different types of glia, microglia and macroglia. Microglia are very uh, small in number. It's less than 5% um, of, this, of the glia in the central nervous system. And these derive from the hematopoietic lineage. So they are very similar to micro, macrophages, uh, but they're macrophages that have, or they're modified macrophages that have uh, entered the nervous system. And so just as macrophages do, when they see damage, they go around, they scavenge stuff up. And they become, in the, in the light of damage, in the light of infections, inflammation, uh, trauma, they become what's called reactive. And uh, literally, the, these, these glia are very hard. It's very difficult to get them non-reactive. They are very sensitive. Um, and, and what do they do? They react to, they react to uh, viruses. They react to infectious particles. They react to um, uh, uh, inflammation and, and, and trauma. And they, and they scavenge this stuff up. And so initially, it's thought that their role is very positive. But they can become um, sort of set in their ways and continue to, uh, to, to uh, change the microenvironment beyond their utility. And so what's emerging is that they might initially have a, a good effect, but as they become, uh, as their actions become prolonged, they start to, to do damage on their own. The macroglia are the major uh, players in, in the glial lineage. lineage. Um, and we can separate them between types of uh, glia that make myelin and types of glia that support neurons. And we can separate them according to their location, either in the periphery or in the central nervous system. So myelin-producing cells in the periphery, these are Schwann cells, and in the central nervous system, there are oligodendrocytes. They're very similar. There are some differences. For example, Schwann cells, one Schwann cell wraps myelin around one neuron, the axon of one neuron. One oligodendrocyte wraps myelin around multiple axons. So that's a difference. Most importantly is the fact that these are two different uh, types of glial cells, so they have two different molecular vulnerabilities. That means that in diseases that attack myelination, these are demyelinating diseases, they will either affect myelin in the periphery or myelin in the central nervous system, but not both. So let's just take an example of that. The most common type of demyelinating disease in the central nervous system is multiple sclerosis, which is typically uh, abbreviated as MS. And the most common type of demyelinating disease in the, in the periphery is um, a heterogeneous group of inherited uh, demyelinating disease called Charcot-Marie tooth diseases. 
Um, and, and so in, in CMT or Charcot-Marie Tooth, only peripheral neurons or axons are demyelinated, and in multiple sclerosis, only central axons are demyelinated. For support cells, we have, uh, in the periphery, we have, uh, actually, I'm sorry, this is called, these are called satellite cells, satellite cells. Um, and in the central nervous system, they're, they're astrocytes. Interestingly enough, uh, astrocytes account for about 20% of the uh, central glia population, whereas this, these oligodendrocytes account for about 70%. The astrocytes are workhorses. They do all sorts of, um, uh, they, they have all sorts of functions, such as um, mopping up excess neurotransmitters, mop, mopping up excess ions that are, are in the uh, extracellular milieu. They, um, uh, they also are critical to synapse formation. The, some synapses get stabilized by these astrocytes. They get to live. Other uh, synapses appear not to be stabilized. They don't get to live, they die. Uh, so it's really important. These astrocytes are very, very important in development. And I wanna say one final thing about these glial cells. There are, there are a few other different types of glial cells that are not named here. You might add this up and reach 95%. And indeed, there are about 5% of the cells are split between some minor types of glial cells. Um, there are glial cells, for example, uh, in the retina, a different type. And there are glial cells that uh, are, are dividing and will, are, serve one function during development, but then actually divide and become either a terminally differentiated glial cell um, or a terminally differentiated uh, neuron. So there are glial cells that are progenitor cells, and that's what we're going to talk about in, in the next uh, section.